Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues, and listeners. Here we are again, another Saturday, flown past. And with that particular word, flown, this one's going to be quite a rapid one. Well, that's what I planned at the beginning. <laughs> be a rapid one. The reason being is Mr. Dixon is on his way back to the UK tomorrow. So looking forward to have you back, Steve. And um, I'm assuming that's to commit to some of the things that uh, we spoke about during the conference and also last week. It is. Morning to you, Chris. Yep, good to be here. It's Saturday morning. Well, it's afternoon for me. It's, um, it's torrential rain here, so I'll be leaving the, uh, leaving the rainy season and monsoon season behind in Malaysia for probably a damp, wet England. But um, I'll be very pleased to get back. You're absolutely right. There's lots to crack on with. We've got, um, we've got uh, I mean, our team at Skylight Aviation has been incredible this last six months. I think like all teams, I think we've been speaking about that as part of the ACHL digital event. A lot of your speakers and you know very senior in the organisation, managing large global you know international teams, all have been uh, very complimented about how the teams responded. My team is not a large team, but it is a, it is a small but global team, and uh, I think everybody has been very very committed during this period. So now is the time for me to get back after um, after a few months away and spend some time with them in developing further our response to kind of the industry. We've also picked up some new client work uh, in Europe, which is great, so that'll keep us busy for, 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 a, for a fair amount of time. But actually also to try to unpick now, you know, where we go after some of these wins that, are, that we spoke about the other day at the ACHL Digital Event, particularly around, you know, trying to, trying to harness some of the uh, collective opportunities in industry that are available for themselves. So I'm looking forward to flying tomorrow. Uh, thanks again to Casa Airways, the only airline that seems to be uh, managing to to um, uh, to maintain uh, a re semi-regular presence. And whilst you're travelling Qatar, as per the new announcement, you'll be able to connect seamlessly with their new Wi-Fi uh, capability, so that you'll be able to keep Excellent in contact news. with I'll, everybody. I'll be keeping contact with you, Chris. And they'll all be so pleased. Well, I, I'd rather keep in contact before the wine is open than um, than after. So um, yes. yeah, we, uh, yeah, I will look forward yeah. to that. Anyway, it'll be good to get back to London. There's lot, there's lots, certainly lots to do. Yeah, and 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 now as you know, as we're going to come in, come into now this second wave that we've been talking about for so long, and people are now realising it's on our doorsteps. There's going to be even more changes coming up. So, the points that you brought up about uniformity and about you know people doing things in the same way, a to make it easier for people to understand the challenges and the benefits of doing things that make sense, but also to reduce the confusion that consumers on the passenger side and anybody else that's looking at the aviation industry and wondering why are things still so different everywhere. So if we look at some of the things that have been announced now, Steve, so you've got the wonderful, wonderful and high success rate of the dogs in Finland. Yes, I was quite taken by this, Chris. Hey? I am um, as a, as a well, as a fellow dog lover, you will understand my uh, my affection uh, for dogs, not just in the in the social sense, but also in the professional environment. Yeah, those fins. Uh, I mean, the fins have always been a pretty smart, innovative bunch, in my view. Um, and um, I think they have uh, they have developed or they have they have demonstrated uh, the use of dogs for COVID. You know, so rather than contraband sniffing dogs, these are COVID sniffing dogs. Um, uh, no longer sniffing out the um, sniffing out the truffles um, uh, or the uh, or the, the, the whatever be might be considered one's bag, but actually in terms of measuring one's health. Yeah. Uh, and if if a, if a if if a member of the public or travelling public has coronavirus, so the report is that they are almost one hundred percent successful. Yeah. Exactly. Um, uh, now I think it's very early days, so we should be very careful and cautious. We should also. Uh, just to add a word of caution about the scalability of of yeah. um, you know of such. Um, but if you can imagine, very very often, Chris, in airports, um, certainly in Europe, uh, in fact globally, you know, dogs are used in normally in the arrivals area in the arrivals setting, yeah. um, uh, and by you know the law enforcement uh, uh, agencies, whether it's border control or it's customs or whatever. Um, to check for money, money sniffing dogs, or yeah. um, cocaine sniffing dogs, or cannabis sniffing dogs, or or uh, in Australia, you know, they, they sniff out um, apples and pears that you're, you know, <laughs> apparently harmful to the environment that quarantine don't allow you to bring in. Now we've got a COVID sniffing dog. I think this is utterly wonderful. So from a from a from a philosophical perspective, to add that to the stable of 
of opportunities for the dog's use in the airport or in testing capability. Wonderful. I'm just cautious yet. Yeah, it's small scale trials. It's not yet been sort of, you know, done on large scale, but, uh, but positive, positive um, news and uh, hopefully with some potential. Exactly. But it's fantastic, isn't it? And I just need to clarify there something because obviously anybody who's got an accent like mine or people that would call themselves Cockneys, that wasn't a Scotsman trying to use rhyming slang when he said apples and pears. He's not talking about stairs. He's actually talking about fruit. So I'll just clarify that one. But yes, we need to be sure that, that, that this works. But how great. My, my, boat, my boat race said it all, Chris. It did indeed, my friend. It did indeed. Shows how international you are, eh? Bilingual. Right. <laughs> Bilingual. Yeah. So, um, but, but seriously, that's a great thing. And then, and then you look at the other end of the spectrum with Singapore with the wristbands. I haven't seen that, Chris, so you need, to enlighten, you need to enlighten me. Yeah, what they're, what they're, they're talking about is ha having a wristband put on people so that they can actually truly monitor what's happening during quarantine. Um, and I would imagine that's as a result of so many other areas, including the UK, where people have come back from vacation and not a single person has contacted them. So it gives some yeah. people a false sense of security. However, with recent turn of events, you know, I think that they're going to be a lot more vigilant now moving forward over the next month. So, you know, it people... certainly looks like it. I'm glad that Malaysia is on the exempt list, Chris. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, um, the one thing I would say about Singapore, I mean, Singapore and Malaysia, I mean, we had, there was all this news yesterday, uh, or not even I mean, Thursday in the UK, about the NHS test and trace app being downloaded. Now I've downloaded it already as a good citizen and I'm not even in the UK yet, but I will, I will use it and I've got no qualms about using it. And it's a decentralized uh, uh, database. So, so there's no, you know, the, 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 there is little worry from me from a privacy perspective or, or you know, a big brother, Her Majesty's government are tracking everywhere you've been or where you might go. It doesn't work like that. It, it uses the, 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 the ID tokens held on the phones to communicate with one another. But I downloaded that, and, and, and apparently this test and trace um, uh, program, so not just the application, but the yeah, program yeah. Yeah. fully, has cost the British taxpayer thus far 12 billion pounds. Now, I find that a phenomenal amount of money. And I know that, um, now as you know, and as some of our listeners will know, I was not in the U I was not in Malaysia, home with my family, when this whole, you know, uh, 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 pesky COVID it started, I was stuck in London, but within a month of lockdown, what they called MCO, Movement Control Order, being put in place in Malaysia, we had an app in Malaysia that was developed and the shops and the retail outlets had got their, their registrations, the, the barcodes were there present, the QR codes on the trains, the, the, the tagging devices were available, the application was recording your data, again in decentralized fashion, and pushing out messages when you're in a medium or high risk area, dependent on where you were or where you'd been. I can't believe that the world's fifth largest economy has taken more than six months and 12 billion pounds to develop this, where, you know, uh, countries in the developing world where I live here did it within a few weeks. I mean, it just, it just, it just begs belief, Chris. Uh, mm -hmm. So Malaysia and Singapore, um, I mean, Singapore would be offended if I said to the developing world, but they're my neighbour. I'm saying it from a from a geographical yeah, 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 yeah. perspective. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Malaysia is still a developing world, third world country, but um, but Singapore certainly wouldn't see that themselves. But they have they have created capability, Chris, that, that that countries in Europe just have not done. And I just wonder why, when we have this have had this device available to us from almost day dot, and without 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 question. You know, the public have generally conformed. It, 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 it seems peculiar to me. So I've got more freedoms by wearing a mask and using my phone to scan in and out than I would do if I didn't have the mask there. So these anti-maskers yeah. or these people yeah. of privacy, just beggars belief, Chris. And, and that has continued to damage confidence and continuing to damage the restoration of air travel and, uh, and leisure travel uh, uh, or business travel in particular. Yeah, and then also people who are looking at, you know, the cost of, of moving from the furlough system to the new system and then you look at if it, if that 12 billion is actually 12 billion i mean it's just it's just a waste of money steve it doesn't make sense and if i can't find out where it's gone yeah well there's lots of there's lots of ways for it to go steve but the point <laughs> is if something is out there why on earth try and create something new again and if it's already on the systems and there's a lot of people complaining now that you know if you haven't got if you haven't got series six or above on the iPhones and certain phones, you can't access it. 
you know, so the, the vulnerable persons are the ones who need to have access on any phone that they've got because they only use their phone for communication, not for anything else. So it's a shame. It's a waste of money. But it's there, will a be, there will be holes in every technology solution, though, Chris. So, so I think the key thing is to manage for the majority and not the exception. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I'm saying, though, Steve, is, you know, like you said, it's been out there. So why on earth not get something out earlier and get people used to it? Yeah. Anyhow, hopefully, touch wood, you know, it'll, it'll make people focus, which is a good thing. Now, talking about testing, some of the carriers are doing their own testing. They're doing testing between airports, etc. So you've got the, the, the different span between Lufthansa and United. So from $5 to $150, roughly. So what do you think of the testing system now that's happening? Well, I was really happy to see that, um, that Lufthansa had um, announced this week they would introduce, in collaboration with a, with a local German uh, medical laboratory, uh, testing capability at Frankfurt and uh, Munich. Um, and I think Lufty were doing that for a, almost a sort of a, you know, per passenger levy um, of something up to the ilk of around $5 a pack, five euros a pack. Um, this week, United also introduced testing capability, uh, pre-departure testing. I think it was specifically initially uh, for the islands and uh, uh, Hawaii is a, is a sort of a, a, a test bed or a pilot, but certainly that was the, that was a suggestion. And it was around between a hundred and hundred fifty dollars per passenger. So I, I'm just, I'm just really nervous now that, you know, with the advent, and I think airlines have, we said this before time and time again, you know, the industry as a whole has been let down by the likes of IATA, uh, ACI, ICAO, EASA, FAA. Um, they've been let down by their own governments and their own, you know, states of, of registration. I mean, airline states of registration. So whether it's Germany or it's North America or it's Australia or whatever. Yeah. And so then, so airlines have gone off and tried to do their own thing. As Heathrow tried to do their own thing, but that was quashed and put on hold because it wasn't government led. Um, airlines are now trying to do testing. Well, testing for what outcome, for what benefit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I suspect only to give custom, their own customers, their own travelers, a level of confidence. Yeah. The second thing is maybe they manage to then collate some data that they can aggregate and share with government or whatever. That's, a, that's a probably a helpful thing. But thirdly, uh, uh, is to say, look, and actually this is from a, from a commercial perspective, is um, in, you know, linked to point one about confidence reservation is, you know, we are doing something, we want to be doing something, we want to encourage our customers that we are doing something, but actually we want also to ensure medical safety or public health safety on board our aircraft. One of the ways we can do that is offer a test to everybody. Exactly. Um, but at a commercial, so then from a commercial decision, I'm just, I, was, I was quite surprised that United had gone you know, one direction and Lufthansa had gone another. Lufthansa basically saying, you know, it's, it's free of charge. Yeah. Uh, five, I mean, let's call it five euros free of charge. Five euros for a family of six, you know, might make a difference of traveling, but I suspect that family of six are not traveling a leisure to stay anyway. But, but essentially, it's, it's incorporated in your fare. United have done the other thing. Now, other airlines... Um, uh, you know, the likes of Emirates, for example, they are asking for a COVID test pre-departure up to 96 hours before. So they will accept a test result up to 96 hours prior to travel. Uh, it, might, it might be 72, but I, sorry, there's lots of test numbers, as you know, Chris. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's it's certainly between 72 and 96. Um, and they, they expect you to go off and do that themselves. In private test facilities or in pri with private laboratories, that maybe the Emirates have got no idea where you're doing that test, but as long as you've got a test yeah. and a piece of paper that says I'm COVID negative, you can fly. But actually, what accreditation or what QA, QC have Emirates done on that? So I'm minded more towards the Lufthansa model that says we are working with a German laboratory, must be bloody great because Germans are great at science for the, for the most part, yes. um, must be a good medical laboratory. We've gone through the QA, QC inspection, it's known to us. And almost we've contracted that party yeah, yeah, in yeah. delivering a service to us. I, that to me sounds like a much more, it's almost got a German shirt on there because I can see black and red um, uh, sleeves. It's just the yellow. You're missing the yellow. Yeah, you don't have the um, actually, uh, a rugby club in Qatar. You'd have the, um, you'd have the German flag on your, um, on your, on your shirt. Um, but I would be more inclined to sort of say from a QAQC perspective, you know, uh, 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 um, you know, uh, integrity. The the, the Lufty solution is one that sounds to me to be 
a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, managed by the airline. Yes, it will require some management, but I'm likely to get more back from that in terms of aggregation of results, the understanding of my passive portfolio, yeah. uh, more which so than why, I would do just from an outsourced lab. Yeah, which is why you're coming back again, you know, to regulators and representative bodies, because people need to have the confidence that, like you just said, whether it's an accreditation or a certification or whatever, that it meets the required standards. Otherwise, people are going to be thinking that every single test is the same as every other test. That's so it's right. important. Yeah. Yeah, no, hugely important. Now, on that point, Steve, we spoke about regulators and you, you mentioned EASA and ICAO. And, and to be honest, they did a great job with putting out early procedures and guidelines, etc. But now there comes a point where everybody is being affected by the practical sizing and everybody's having to reduce staff, they're losing experience, people are taking early redundancy, et cetera. If you take the case of IATA with Glyn Hughes and, um, and, and, and several others, the, the question now is what do they do moving forward? And I think we covered a, a collaboration and some people would say collaboration is a well overused word and why, why don't we actually show it, et cetera. I think this is a fantastic opportunity now for the next six months for the regulators, for the representative bodies to start coming together, pool resources, second where necessary if there's a specialization group, represent the community and the industry rather than the individual body and start doing something now from a, a, a critical perspective, not recommended, a critical perspective that must be implemented. And I think there's a great opportunity now to bring a, that sort of solidarity and the aviation family together. And I know that's something that you're looking at with regards to, to customers and, and, and making sure that people are getting the benefits, which also helps with the cost and cash flow issue. Yeah, indeed. I think, um, look, I, I agree with everything you said there, Chris. I think this the extension of that is saying, you know, how does one get below the skin or get under the surface or under the bonnet of some of these firms that, that are really, you know, as we've spoken before, some of the smaller firms, Chris, are the ones that have, you know, stood out really well from doing the right thing by the passenger, the right thing by their staff member, the right yeah. thing by their board, the right thing, the right thing overall. Uh, I'm just worried and nervous that they don't get the recognition for that going forward in terms of winning some of those content or winning some of those awards or being able to participate in some of those RFPs when they come up because they won't have the, the management scale or the management. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, uh. And so that's something that we want to work with industry on and work with our partners on, work with some of our, our smaller customers on. The other side is, you know, we, we've, 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 we've got, um, you know, just sort of talking about collaboration. You say it's an overused word, Chris. I mean, collaboration. Some say, I say some say it's an overused word. Some say it's not. I mean, I, yeah, I, I wouldn't say it's overused. And I, I, well, from, from that, I would say you wouldn't say that either. Exactly. Um, the reality is it, it just means, for me, it means a couple of things. It means being fair and equitable to one another in yeah. the process of collaborating. Yep. It means being transparent in your dealings, whether it's employee to employee, employee to employer, employer to supplier, or, or, or whatever, you know, multiple variants are there. Another thing it means is saying, actually, how do I get the, get, this, this used to be, and I think it was Des Vardanis on the closing session you had with them at ACHL. You know, Des said sort of, you know, this sort of, you know, either navel gazing or inward looking, it's all about me. You know, it's got to be all about, actually, it's no longer all about me. Yeah. Because... Whilst I want Skylight Aviation to succeed, and uh, you know the CEO of Singapore Airlines wants Singapore Airlines to succeed, and uh, you know uh, the Swissport CEO wants Swissport, to, we, we all we all want the same thing at different parts and levels of our game, right? Yeah. However, what we do collectively today as an industry in collaborating Correct. and Correct. cooperating, and that means that you're rolling your sleeves up, and uh, you know I heard. Uh, I think it was Stuart Angus saying the other day on the, on the digital event as well, saying, um, you know, we'd never worked as hard. His yeah. team has never worked so hard in their lives. I, I think my team would, would probably agree, actually, whether it's looking for opportunities or it's refining yeah. or it's helping clients or it's doing pro bono work for our existing customers. Yep. Um, uh, we haven't worked as hard, but now we've got to work hard for a collective outcome. So collaboration actually is about getting a collective outcome that matters to all, that will benefit all. So if we can do things in Skylight Aviation, and you know, we'll be doing this next week and then over the next few weeks and I'm back in the UK with a team with our sleeves rolled up in collaboration with, with regulators and with, with, with government and the like around trying to identify solutions that, yes, we might win a bit of work off, Chris, that's fantastic. You know, nobody's here for, for a charitable cause, 
But the reality is I, we're here for the greater good. And the greater good is trying to get that bloody curve, you know, kicked back up as far as practically possible it can, um, whilst dealing with a lot of the unknowns from government that government throw on us every day. You know, lockdown open, lockdown open, restriction green lane, green lane, red lane. I mean, what a lot of, I mean, it, so we've got to say, look, forget all of that noise. We can't change a lot of that noise, Chris. Yeah. What we can change are our actions. And as I said, but I said, you live by the sword and you die by the sword. But let that sword at least be used collectively to yeah, attack yeah. all of this, some of this, um, this stuff head on and make sure that we win for the greater good. So, yeah, so busy few weeks, um, busy few weeks trying to do that ahead yeah. in, in, in that sort of collaborative sense. Yeah, but it, it's just such a shame, isn't it, that there's been so many opportunities in the past for people to come together, but they, whether it's ego, whether it's organisational structure, whether it's representative uh, recognition, whatever it is, but now, now, surely, people should now start surely. all the resources, surely. come together surely. and do what's right. I, I think the other thing, I think, I, I can't remember if it was, um, if it was Des, it might have been Des and then you again, the closing session, or Des and um, Stanley, which was a great, a great session. So any of, the, any of our listeners, Chris, that didn't listen to that session, I think the Stan and Des show was, is one that, if you don't watch anything else in ACHL Digital, including my own, at least watch, um, at least watch Stan and Des. So that was a cracking session. The, gen the gentleman and the hitman. <laughs> but, um, but there's a piece that you spoke about airport relationships, airports and airlines and airports and ground handlers and airport supply chain. And I've said so well, they're all skeptical and cautious of one another. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But look, look, this is not about the size of your ego. It's not about the size of your, your, your contribution to that one business, you know? So clearly, you know, uh, Fortress Heathrow, British Airways contributes a lot to how. But let's stop the egos from driving unilateral outcomes to the detriment of the community. Yep. Let's actually work together to solve for everybody. So airports and airlines are the bloody worst at this. And especially, you know, and I don't think either is better than the other, by the way, and I've worked on both sides. I worked for British Airports Authority, I worked for many airlines. Um, they're both as bad as one another. So I think what's got to happen, I don't say that, I'm not pointing the finger at anybody in particular, by the way, but I'm just saying airports and airlines and the ground handler and the supply chain inside and outside of the airport this is about coming together, losing the ego at the front door, and actually trying to do the, the, the greater good for all. So actually, it's almost sort of a sort of a philanthropical philosophy, Chris. Right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You know. No, I, I totally agree. And the one thing, the one thing with the um, with the digital event, all of us, we we um, you know, we we just try to see how positive people are and how how much they they genuinely care. And you know whether people say words like collaboration and care are overused or not real. That's the only way. That's the only way to succeed, and it's the only way to be positive. And with so many pressures and stresses now, you know, God only knows what what this Christmas is going to bring for people. With it, you know, putting extra pressures on them. There's going to be more layoffs. It's going to be such a tough, tough time. And I agree with you. Everybody should be working now so that we get that V curve or the sharpest U curve possible as soon as things open up and there's capability there. So, you know, bring on the vaccines sooner rather than later. Bring all as many dogs as possible if they can do so, but also make people have a little bit more of a, an understanding and a modicum of common sense with what they're doing now because they're, they're just making it worse for so many others, which is such a cry and shame. Now, Steve, the other week, we were supposed to be focusing or giving a mention about Hong Kong. Um, so, you know, I think we should, we should at least bring Hong Kong into, into question there. So I know you've got a few words to say about Hong Kong and what's going on. Well, on, 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 only Chris, I mean, Hong Kong is my sort of, um, you know, I'm fortunate to live in KL, you know, I can fly back to London or actually mostly anywhere I need to go from here directly. Um, uh, you know, my second and third choice would be, you know, between sort of, um, Singapore and Hong Kong. Um, uh, and so I spent a lot of time in Hong Kong. In fact, I, I um, set up a business in Hong Kong. Jetstar Hong Kong wasn't terribly successful because we got um, we got uh, squeezed out by um, by Cathy exerting a lot of their uh, political pressure. But that's for another podcast. I think we'll leave that for another time. We can discuss that with the uh, with the others. Um, so I've lived in Hong Kong for a short time. Um, I think. I mean, what I saw last week was um, the Hong Kong government has been pretty arbitrary 
that we talk about quarantine and the blunt instrument that quarantine is. It yeah. doesn't actually yeah. solve the problem, doesn't help restore confidence, doesn't restore spend, doesn't restore the economic benefits of travel, doesn't restore kind of the, 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 the greater good for the industry as we're just speaking to. All it simply does is discourage people from flying rather than testing. So people say, quarantine, 14 days? No, thank you. Testing, ah. That seems like, what, what's the, what are we going to do? Well, they test the airport departure. Fabulous, how much does it cost? Well, it's actually five euros. Oh, I'm in. And yeah. you don't get to go. You've got your, your, you've got your COVID-19 insurance cover and you're, you're, uh, you're rebooked, whatever, what if, you know, if anything, God forbid, did, if you were positive, which I think is a rare, rare event these days, but, um, but if you were, although some say it's rising. Um, um, but Hong Kong have gone really arbitrary and really hard on this. And there was a flight from Air India into Kuala Lumpur the other day, and then KL into Hong Kong. And five passengers were found positive on arrival in Hong Kong. Yeah. So those customers had transited, they originated in, in India, I can't remember yeah. which city it was, but originally in India, uh, transit through KL onto Hong Kong. Now you can imagine these Indians or these Hong Kong citizens or Hong Kong residents had been fighting for months to get home. You can just imagine that. It's yeah, 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 yeah. And they get there, they found COVID positive. Well, okay, so they've dealt with, they're taken off and they've got the, the Hong Kong, the airport expo there, that they're able to test everything. But more than that, Cathay Dragon, the airline that took them into Hong Kong, was then banned from flying from Kuala Lumpur. Yeah. So I said, right, so we've now, there's now an arbitrary ban. So rather than the Hong Kong government work collaboratively with industry to get proper testing protocols in place, they say, the no, origin. you ain't flying here. Yeah. So can you imagine from the Cathay management perspective, now the Hong Kong government is now a shareholder of Cathay, funnily enough, after the cash injection. Um, it's like shooting themselves in the bloody foot. Yeah. So after these air routes are now open after such a long time, they're now closing down again. That's bloody stupid. It's bloody mindedness. And it's so parochial because they're thinking, well, we can't do this. We've got to keep everybody out. Now I'm seeing Hong Kong are getting a lot of pressure from IATA, specifically directed at Hong Kong, I suspect because Cathay, I've had a word in the ear of some of the lobby groups and their friends at AART and said, you've got to help us here, mate. I mean, the Hong Kong government might be a shareholder, but they're talking bollocks. We obviously can't well, speak well, out well, publicly. We can't speak out publicly about this in, in Cathay because they for fear of recrimination and, you know, how Hong Kong works as semi sort of communist sort of regime nowadays with, with the Chinese state uh, involved. So um, I suspect that they've used other mouthpieces, Chris, to help voice the concerns. And that's absolutely right. So Hong Kong wants a sort of a bastion of success. The original Asian hub, if you remember, Chris. Yeah, yeah, uh, always. It, it was always. Before uh, Singapore, before yeah. Bangkok, before KL, it was yeah. Hong Kong. That was the place to, to, to fly to and from if you were transiting through this part of the world. Yeah. And now you've got this idiocy of a, of a government led by Carrie Lam, uh, who just uh, go down the path of closing everybody out when it doesn't suit them. It probably suits them for other political reasons. And I'll leave that one there. Very good. Salam, I know you're listening in the background. So this is the first reference to Christmas. So we need to bleep out a particular word that, that refers to Christmas decoration. So we'll do that at a later point. Christmas? Yes. I don't remember if you're talking about Christmas. No, you didn't. But there's something that needs to be bleeped out. And I'm talking about something that you hang on Christmas trees. And, bubbles, uh, bubbles. There you go. That's the word that we should have used. <laughs> okay, but anyhow, that will be bleeped and it will be it will be addressed. That's one 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 and a half an hour, Chris, is not bad going. I feel strongly about that because I, I love Hong Kong. I think um I think our our um, correspondent from Hong Kong was was keen to get our view. That's my view. I feel I feel strongly for it. I yep. do I do I do think that uh, this is more broadly, not just to Hong Kong. I do think, Chris, that there are challenges with those types of government in being you know pragmatic and transparent yeah, yeah, in yeah. working bilaterally so that yeah, hong kong is not alone i mean hong kong is a city state so called um but there are other islands that operate in isolation whether they're an island community or not and they do so for political gain for no other reason yeah 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 and 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 to, sh to show their strength and and for other reasons you're, you're quite supposedly yeah, yeah yeah now just coming to an end, coming to an end, because I know you've got to get yourself ready for travel and looking forward to seeing you when you get back. Um, but also now, you know, it's very obvious, even our, our friends who still owe us a couple of baseball caps and a T-shirt 
Wizz Air, they've also slashed capacity now as well. So it's yeah. shown that you know everybody is going to be slashing capacity, and this 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 winter or coming up to Christmas, and the first couple of months going to be very very tough for everybody. So coming back to collaboration and care again, whatever anybody can do, you know people need to reach out now and and just see the bigger picture and see how many people are affected because it's going to be a tough a tough period for so many. And it's uh, it's one thing being in lockdown when the weather's great and you've got gardens, etc. It's another thing being in lockdown when everything's dark outside and the weather's terrible as well. So thoughts go out to everybody. You know, please, God, things won't be as bad as they possibly can be. So without further ado, my, my bilingual colleague and friend, okay, so now I can bring you up to London and I know that you'll know what's going on. Okay. I'd like to... Yeah, With some jelly deals, a, a bit of jelly deals, Chris, and um, uh, what's that? Uh, jelly deals and liquor, or pie yes. mash and liquor. Yes, yeah. it's yeah. a great shop. I, well, you don't know. I used to live in Mile End, Chris. So, um, so that's fairly East End as they come. Uh, and I've got a lot of mates in Walthamstow and Leytonstone. So I think you don't get much more East End than that. So I, I'd be, I'd happily tread those boards again, as they say in industry. I think not how our industry, please. but somebody else's industry. Yeah. Think how pleased they'll be now that you referenced Apple and Stairs and Boat Race. So fantastic. <laughs> Look after yourself. Have a safe flight. Thanks a lot. Cheers, right. Chris. Thanks again, Steve. I'll see you next Appreciate week. Appreciate your time while your schedule's so busy. Thank you. No problem. Cheers.